Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, thanks everyone for joining. My name is Jude Blanchett and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Um, we're gonna spend the next 29 to 28 minutes uh, talking about a really important issue, the issue of governance and governance reform in China. Um, this is an issue of pressing importance for the Communist Party in China, but one that hasn't really received a great deal of attention uh, outside the country. I think swept up in the news cycle of U.S.-China tensions and, and trade war. Yet, nonetheless, there's been some important um, progress and, and some important uh, um, dynamics which have been occurring under uh, the Xi Jinping administration to reform China's entire political system through this lens of this issue of governance. Um, indeed, I think governance modernization is one of the, if not the single biggest domestic priority for uh, CCP General Secretary Xi Jinping. And he sees this as really central to the long-term rule of the Communist Party of China. So to dig into this issue with me today is Neil Thomas, a senior research associate uh, at the think tank at the Paulson Institute. Um, and Neil was the author of an excellent deep dive. And he sees this as really central to the long-term rule of, Beijing, of the Communist Party uh, which of focused China. Heavily so on to the dig into this governance and institutional reform. So Neil, thank you very much. For Ideas for Lab. Us. All on your time, you. live you. or on So I wanted to... Uh, start by taking stock essentially of where things stood in terms of how the party was thinking about governance in late 2012 um, when this plucky young upstart of a, of a provincial party secretary named Xi Jinping finally ascends to uh, the top office in China. Um, so can you give I'm... a perspective of, it, as the Xi administration was coming into power, how were they looking at the, the condition of the, the party state? What was their assessment of the health of the political system? Sure. I think the, the first thing to say in terms of talking about governance is that it's, it's a perennial problem for, for any country and especially for the Chinese Communist Party. Um, as others have noted, at whatever time period, whatever leadership, it's not easy to, to manage a political party with tens of millions of members that governs a country of what's now you know, 1.4 billion people, and the challenges uh, in terms of politics, economics, culture, society, the environment have only been getting more complex. So, I mean, in my reading, Xi Jinping's you know, intense focus on governance since he did come to power in November 2012 uh, is closely tied to the growing sense of internal crisis that was developing within the CCP under the leadership of Hu Jintao. Um, who was ruling from 2002 to 2012. And so, so Hu Jintao's tenure was the high point of a uh, approach to governance known as collective leadership, a uh, major characteristic of which was that you know, different members of the then expanded nine-person Politburo Standing Committee would basically be in charge of certain policy domains, with Hu as the paramount leader, serving much more as a first among equals than she has done. And so the decentralization of authority that this implied at the, the top level also extended to you know, central ministries and local governments. And its virtue was that looser supervision helped to facilitate the, the breakneck growth that China enjoyed throughout much of the, the 2000s and even into the 2010s after the global financial crisis. But this looser supervision also undercut central uh, policymaking and the ability of the center to get the provinces and ministries to do what it wanted. And in Beijing struggled to address the major negative externalities from this breakneck growth, uh, like corruption, inequality, and pollution. And this by 2012 was leading to a growing sense of crisis. Even some senior party theoreticians um, writing quite openly about their sense of disappointment and their sense of failure at the, the Hu Wen administration. And this kind of came to a head in the, the Borshi Lai crisis in 2012, where, where he and um, we think other senior leaders, including Zhou Yongkang, 
may have been working to usurp Xi Jinping's ascension to the top leadership. And I think this, you know, this so-called factionalism, this kind of fragmentation of authority was seen as the result of many years of um, slackening um, authority coming from the top leader and from the Politburo standing committee. You know, Neil, that brings up a good point. And I was thinking about this um, when I was doing some reading over the weekend, um, how in, in these sort of this period when Xi Jinping comes to power, and again, as you mentioned, this was a, a fairly acute sense of concern, if not crisis, that was rippling through the party. Um, can we distinguish, especially as she comes to power and moves through and starts to promote some of these governance reforms between governance reform as a fortification of the political system to, to achieve outcomes from governance reform as a, um, a way to fend off or at least keep the Communist Party in control? And I, I, obviously there could be a Venn diagram overlap between those two, but they are distinct. One is essentially holding on to power, so we're gonna buttress the system so that the party rules perpetually. And the other is we gotta modernize the darn system because we've got a bunch of challenges that China needs to proactively confront. And again, those could overlap, but they also could be distinct. Do you have any thoughts on what was motivating the Xi administration, especially coming into this, you know, coming in, in 2012, 2013? I think that it really is um, a bit of both, unfortunately, to give the kind of weaselly answer <laughs> that you're trying to avoid. Because um, I think the way I look at how uh, the CCP leadership approaches governance, right, is kind of an optimization problem. The constraint being the continued rule of the Chinese Communist Party. And so Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping have adopted like different uh, ways to, to solve this problem. Um, and in terms of Xi, I think, I mean, a way to kind of see this is particularly like the anti-corruption campaign, uh, which is obviously one of the, the hallmarks of his approach to power and a key tool for him to you know, increase compliance from uh, lower level officials in localities as well as in ministries. Um, and I think the best research out there by people like Peter Lorenzen and others shows that this, you know, one part of this is Xi Jinping holding on to power by going after potential factional rivals. Um, you know, no one really close to Xi is being targeted. But at the same time, um, most of the officials and cadres that are being caught up in this are you know, demonstrably corrupt and are more corrupt than their peers who are not being caught up in the net. So there's simultaneously uh, a move that's always at the back of Xi Jinping's mind as to what's going to you know, solidify his position within the party so he can get through the governance reforms that he wants to, to make happen. Because I think, you know, it's a mistake to not um, believe that Xi Jinping really cares about the future of, of China and the party as distinct from his own personal power. But he needs to hold on to that power in quite a, you know, low information, quite a risky environment compared to, say, even in the president of the United States. Um, and to do that, he needs to think about politics but at the same time um, he's going to not be able to achieve these high-level goals to, you know, realize that the two centenary goals and you know, make China a, a great, prosperous world power by the middle of the century, unless he is actually doing something real on the ground, you know, such as by, by purging demonstrably corrupt officials and you know, targeting the most corrupt officials rather than just anyone who tends to who can you know, be dragged into the net. One of the early key moments in the Xi administration was the third plenum in 2013. So this comes about a year after Xi Jinping comes to power. And most of the, ex most of the focus at the time, I remember, was on some of the language around markets playing a decisive uh, role in allocating resources. So this really seemed like a clarion call of market reform. This confirmed some of the early speculation about Xi Jinping um, not necessarily being a liberal, but certainly having that reformist gene, part of it, his lineage, his father, you know, Xi Jongshun was a, a famed reformer. Um, you've written, though, about how there was an overemphasis on some of the market marketizing language within the document. And actually, it was heavily political, including this issue of governance. This almost feels like the first big declaration by Xi that governance is going to be a focus. I wonder if you can talk about sort of in, in the early years, 2013, 2014, 2015, what are some of the instances or manifestations of this governance agenda that we begin to see emerge? Yeah, so the um, third plenum in November, 2013, I think 
exactly right. It is a very important signal, actually, of this early focus on, on governance and indeed of strengthening the party in, in relation to, to the state. And that's kind of the first uh, party document, and it's you know, a high-level decision, the highest in the, the hierarchy of party documents, saying that you know, developing the system of socialism with Chinese characteristics and advancing you know, the modernization of China's governance system and capacity, which was a the theme of the, the fourth plenum, that's the, the overall goal of Xi Jinping's desire to comprehensively deepen reforms, which includes the economic reforms that you mentioned, but also, uh, as you pointed out in the piece, um, about half of the reforms proposed were related basically to governance and didn't have a specifically economic um, component to them. Uh, so one example of this that we saw progress on after the um, third plenum in 2013 uh, was a desire to increase the uh, law-based governance of the country. And um, so that was one of the sections in the kind of 60-point reform document that came out of the, the third plenum. And we saw the fourth plenum of the 18th Central Committee, which was held in 2014, being focused specifically on this issue of um, what's sometimes translated as you know, rule of law or rule by law, but the idea that um, to govern better, the party needs to pass more specific, uh, more detailed regulations as to how uh, the government works, as to how people can relate to each other. Um, we had the civil code pass very recently. The MPC, it's a very recent example. Um, but the proliferation of uh, intra-party regulations uh, after the third plenum is perhaps like one of perhaps the best example of how that started to come into, into play. So Xi Jinping um, passed a new uh, guideline for party the, uh, the behaviour and discipline of party uh, members, the first time that had been overhauled since the, the early 80s, I think, with a general theme to increase supervision, and to increase the, uh, the disciplinary options available to those who did not follow the, the party line. So I think that's one you know, particularly good example of how those things played out. And in a more general sense, we saw the uh, Xi Jinping taking a, a bigger role in basically every major policy area through his uh, creation of new leading small groups, um, such as the, the Comprehensively Deepening Reform Small Group, which kind of, um, took on the role basically of the state council, um, but had Xi Jinping as the head of the party leading that institution rather than Li Keqiang, the head of the state. Um, as we're sort of moving through time here, and uh, um, from Xi coming to power 2012 and through the 13th plenum, you've started to, um, you've started to highlight what are some of the emerging core elements of, of governance. Party dominance is obviously, is becoming one of them. Um, are we seeing sort of a, a co, is this just, governance just another word for sort of, of, of um, cementing absolute party rule, but with some, with some fancy sort of uh, terms like modernization and governance and institutionalization? Or do you think there is something there, there beyond simply installing and instituting a party over which there's no, there's no sort of external constraints on it? Um, I think that's something that we, we've kind of simplified the C administration or the C era simply um, pushing the party farther and farther out. Is that all this is, or is there, is there something else to it? I think there is something else to it. Um, so obviously that the high level that we've been talking at, it is very much Xi Jinping consolidating his power um, and Xi Jinping is everywhere. But that's, there's a lot going on within the Chinese party state system, kind of beneath the headlines, if you like. Um, so, I mean, this kind of takes us to the, the 2018 um, party state restructuring, which is a good example. So um, you see like a whole range of you know, regulations and reorganizations. You know, can you first give some context for, for folks about when, where, what this, what this reform program was? Sure. Um, so at the, the two sessions in 2018, so the annual meetings of the National People's Congress, which is you know, China's rubber stamp legislature, and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is a, um, a consultative mechanism under the, the party system. Um, there was a basically the most significant um, reforms of the, the party state system uh, were passed since the, the early 1980s, arguably of the entire reform era. And basically we saw a lot of 
um, informal organizations uh, in the party, mostly the leading small groups, uh, particularly those on comprehensively deepening reforms, those on foreign affairs, those on the economy, um, being made um, formal institutions, so being made commissions with the power to issue documents and basically to um, operate within the Chinese political system in their own right. We also saw a significant um, you know, rationalization of the state administration. There's a reduction in the number of ministries under the state council from about 34 to 26, I think. And there was a big focus there on removing overlapping responsibilities, strengthening oversight over uh, areas like financial markets, social services, and environmental protection in terms of how those uh, ministries were consolidated and, reorg and reorganized which kind of signals this move that she's made towards a, you know, a new principal contradiction, which is kind of the, the heart of uh, Chinese, the ideological heart of Chinese policymaking, uh, from this focus on breakneck growth under the Hu Jintao era, that's a simplify, to a much greater focus on the, the quality of life of the Chinese people. So hence this focus on the environment, reducing pollution, uh, on equality, uh, so reducing social tensions, as well as you know, improving the lives of those in poverty, of the anti-poverty is a big focus of Xi Jinping's domestic agenda. Um, so in terms of what was reformed there, and in terms of the you know, hundreds and thousands of regulations that had to be tweaked and that had to be passed to you know, uh, reorganize these responsibilities and make it clearer and uh, less conflicting, I think we do see evidence of a pretty serious effort to, by the party state under Xi to address these these problems and these are the kind of pressing crises that were identified at the tail end of the, the Hu Jintao era. So I think Xi Jinping sees progress on these issues as being really crucial to his you know, larger goals to you know, make China a great and powerful country. This theme was picked up again in late 2019 at the fourth plenum, which is another one of these markers where it, it at the time didn't receive as much attention as it as it should have. There were some um, rumors going into this that we were going to see some political machinations or some political drama, maybe even some indication of who a possible successor would be. None of that came to fruition, and so therefore the thing kind of dropped like a rock. But um, you you wrote quite extensively about the plenum and how we we missed a pretty important story there. Or if you could just dwell for a moment on what happened at that plenum and how does that tie into this bigger, broad arc of Xi's theory of governance? Yeah, so I think the fourth plenum of October 2019 was a really important um, party meeting. Um, so it's all 270 odd members of the Central Committee. It was preceded by the longest gap between plenums in the post Mao era, um, 20 months or so, I think. So there was a lot of speculation, as you pointed out, about whether there was resistance to Xi Jinping's rule or whether he'd be unveiling a sweeping set of reforms to address criticisms made by the Trump administration. Um, and I think we did get a very significant uh, decision, but it relates precisely to this um, theme that was raised in the third plenum in 2013 about you know, modernizing China's system and capacity for governance. And this uh, decision that was issued by the fourth plenum was really the kind of an authoritative overview of all the key priorities of Xi Jinping's administration up to that point. Um, and it's basically kind of a uh, high level message about the importance of reforming institutional structure of the Chinese party state to improve its capacity uh, to govern. And in terms of the kind of the tenets of this approach, uh, we saw a few major things that I kind of picked up. Um, so perhaps the, the foremost important things are you know, this institutionalization of the party state. Um, so this is obviously something that's been happened, happened at the uh, state or party state reorganization, but uh, at the same time, it's kind of a message to continue sending out new um, regulations in terms of monitoring cadres, in terms of educating cadres, um, because whilst a lot has happened at the formal level in the last few years, um, you still see from Xi Jinping's speeches and even his comments around the fourth plenum that there's still issues with implementation. Um, with all of these officials, um, millions of public servants around the country, uh, Xi Jinping, with all his power, with all his cult of personality, 
still struggles to get a lot of his policies implemented at the, the grassroots, whether that's from corruption or shirking or just different local priorities, that depends. Um, but that was one of the, the tenets of the decision. We also saw um, ideological education being a, seen as a priority. So in Xi Jinping's mind, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Communist Party, um, it basically occurred because it grew weak and slack in the ideological sphere and people stopped believing in the Soviet Communist Party as the um, best way to, to govern the country, not just the ordinary people, but also cadres. So we've seen this uh, big campaign to you know, remain true to the original aspiration and not forget the original mission of the, the Chinese Communist Party. So that was another key theme. Then also the idea of um, people-focused government, so more consultative mechanisms to gather the opinion of Chinese people and to then um, incorporate that into policy making, And then also a law-based governance, which I raised earlier. So the idea that uh, the increasing regulation, the increasing definition of the responsibilities and of party and state organizations um, and the way that people themselves in China, you know, ordinary people can you know, resolve disputes being through regulation, through law, rather than through you know, corruption or guanxi or whatever it may be. I wanted to you know, just use our final eight minutes to, to look now, both, both look at the implications of this governance system, but there's, there's a couple areas I want to focus on. One is, so Xi Jinping has spent the better part of now eight years restructuring, revising, upgrading, bolstering, resurfacing, whatever, what, what, you know, a whole host of initiatives that are targeted at this modernization effort. But precisely because, and as you've written, this is about preparing the party to deal with this, these sort of rising number of challenges, or as you call them, complexities. Uh, December of last year, one of these complexities emerged in, in Wuhan, China, which is you know, the, the, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, this was in many ways, we would have thought precisely the event which this refurbishing of the party state, centralizing decision-making, um, re reauthorizing the cellular structure of, of, the, of the communist party, you know, making the Leninism capital L again, precisely was to be able to effectively respond to such a challenge. Um, I wanna get your, your evaluation of, especially those early months, let's say, you know, early December until, Jin, until Xi Jinping gives his, his, his command on January 20th to kick the system into gear. Um, how would you evaluate those sort of month and a half of that early period in, in the context of these governance reforms? Did they fail? Is this not the right uh, comparison? What is your take on this? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the response, the initial response to COVID-19 kind of exemplifies many of the governance deficiencies that Xi Jinping wants to address, but it also exemplifies some of the deficiencies that result from his approach, which has been to, to centralise power within the centre. Um, so you saw, in terms of the actual public health response at the beginning, there was a very quick detection of something going wrong, there's very quick sequencing of the, uh, the new disease, and there was, uh, a, I think, a successful response from the purely um, technical infrastructure that had been put in place since uh, the SARS crisis in 2002-2003. The system was there to respond um, to the, the pandemic and to report it up. But where it went wrong was in, at a political level, um, where especially you know, at the very beginning, you know, local officials um, discouraged reporting, local officials disciplined um, doctors that were spreading um, information about this outbreak through, through WeChat. There was a you know, televised disciplining of eight doctors in Wuhan on January 2nd which kind of sent a chill through the, that community. Um, and there was some, some failure as well in terms of being very rigidly attached to very high standards of, of testing, which you know, is arguably a, a positive development from SARS, but in terms of how strictly they were adhered to and how unwilling local officials seemed to be to adapt to a new situation um, and to kind of explore what's, what may have been been going on at a politically sensitive time when the local, um, the, the city and then the provincial party congresses were about to happen in the lead up to 
what was meant to be a, a March date for the national level um, two sessions. Um, so we see a perhaps unwillingness uh, to take risks from local officials, which could be attributed to Xi Jinping's you know, increase of centralization, increasing discipline of lower level officials. Um, it could also be read as something that's more um, endemic to authoritarian systems. It's kind of hard to pass exactly the, um, the, the blame in that sense. Um, we also saw there was at the central level, I mean, the Associated Press had report about how at least the National Health Commission were considered COVID-19 to be a potentially the biggest thing since SARS um, on an epidemic level um, on January the 14th. That's a good week before Xi Jinping um, kind of established COVID-19 as the system's top priority to fight. Um, so you have like the, the technical aspects of governance, I think working well and potentially working very well in that initial period but the, the politics of Xi Jinping's China and the increasing kind of um, constricting of you know, room for uh, lower level innovation and risk taking, um, potentially uh, discouraging a, a more honest reckoning with, with what could be going on. But then in terms of once it, the center did it, identify the problem as being something that was the top priority for the country, I mean, Xi Jinping even said that in from February the second, like very early in the pandemic, before it was under control in Wuhan, that this was, you know, quote, a, a big test for China's system of governance. Uh, so exactly what he was trying to uh, strengthen and to consolidate at the fourth plenum. Um, and once that top priority was established, the system turned out to be quite effective, simply because the state can mobilize basically all of its resources to mm -hmm. fight this well-defined thing. And accountability um, is quite clear in terms of the metrics used to you know, reduce the number of infections and deaths. You know, I want to just just the last few minutes. I want to get your your um, if if um, if your crystal ball is not smashed like mine is. <laughs> wanted to um, have you look into this to project out. Um, it strikes me that one of the you you just highlighted some of the the mobilizational capabilities of a of a of a streamlined tight party system is as you say the ability to sort of channel resources and and so long as we're broadly in sympathy with the with the governance issue they're trying to tackle we may be in, in some ways appreciative or in the united states looking at our own democratic deficiencies sometimes overly enthusiastically in awe of authoritarian systems and what, what they can do but it strikes me that that same cap capability can be directed at Xinjiang, for example, and that same sort of um, all-encompassing mobilizational capabilities. And now layering on top of that sort of technological capabilities on this model of, gov of party-dominated governance can take you in some very dark places. Um, I just want you to think out, you know, three, five, ten years. Um, pick your challenge that China is going to deal with. Um, whether that's a domestic challenge or what appears increasingly likely, which is global challenges, whether those are geopolitical, uh, pandemic, climate change, what is your prognosis for if we if we do a linear straight line extrapolation from this model of governance, um, of increased role of the party, further centralization, marginalization of, of the state council and what appears to be increasing, which is this ideological domain of, of governance, whether that's a, you know, don't forget your original intentions leading small group, which, which is fusing ideology and governance. What is your prognosis for, is this C model for governance going to be able to, or better position China to deal with this proliferation of increasingly complex challenges, or does this set China on a uh, you, you can tell my own opinion in the way I'm framing this question, but or does it set China on a, a, a potentially very problematic uh, path? And I'll, 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 I'll uh, yeah, wonder if I can get your your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think there is this um, this tension, right? Maybe a dialectic between um, mo being able to mobilize resources to effectively deal with certain isolated issues, which you know, COVID nineteen is everything went to the side. I mean, COVID nineteen was the priority and it's very, the system was very effective at challenging that. But obviously in terms of the long-term future of China, um, this is not a single issue problem. Um, there's controlling epidemics, but there's also you know, improving uh, you know, 
continued economic growth, there's managing relations with the US, there's managing an increasingly complex international profile through the Belt and Road Initiative. And there's you know, even broader issues of public health and social services and you know, this whole range of things that China needs to get right in order to, to continue growing and to, um, to achieve what Xi Jinping wants to achieve. But I think you're right that there's a lot of risks that come with this um, centralization of authority and power. Obviously, it means that uh, there's a lot more work and a lot more responsibility for Xi Jinping and his team at the top. And so if they make mistakes and if they um, don't get it right, um, in whether that's COVID-19 or whatever the next challenge is, um, then you have a risk of the entire system being mobilized in the wrong direction with you know, potentially um, very bad policy results. So I think it will depend a lot on what the kind of external shocks are to the system um, in terms of you know, China's you know, future economic and uh, social trajectory. So it's, um, there are strengths for sure in terms of the reforms that um, Xi Jinping is trying to uh, pass for China's governance. It does need a lot of these um, moves towards greater you know, rationalization, legalization, um, more clear lines and definitions of authority. That's generally going to make the system work better. But at the same time, it's not getting any more open. It's not getting any more comfortable with um, information that doesn't necessarily confirm the, the biases it already has. Then you run the risk of being, being blindsided by mm -hmm. these unexpected events in the future. So the crystal ball is obviously very cloudy, but I think those are the, the things that I'd be watching out for. That balance between uh, increasing competence and increasing, um, I guess, uh, focus in a, in a negative sense on just what is, is ahead rather than all of the potential risks that are out there that might be being overlooked right now. Great. Well, that's a, a good note to end it on. Uh, Neil, thank you very much. Uh, uh, shout out to Neil and all his uh, comrades at the Paulson Institute who are doing really fantastic work, including a project which Neil just recently wrapped up called the Committee, um, which is a really uh, helpful, fantastic uh, visualization and database for us to understand leaders and leadership in, uh, in the Communist Party and a tool that as we gear up for the 20th Party Congress, um, we should be we should be utilizing I think quite frequently. Um, so um, want to thank you for spending thirty three minutes with us today, Neil, and uh, for the work that you and your colleagues do. Thank you, Jude. Uh, it's great to be here. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>